Our first presenter is uh, Jared Thomas. He's a CCUS projects manager for Southern Company Services, Research and Technology Management. Um, I'm not sure, I actually haven't met Jared yet. Right there, great. <laughs> so Jared, if you wanna come on up, uh, uh, please help me welcome uh, Jared. All right, so as he said, I'm Jared Thomas. I'm the carbon capture and utilization uh, sequestration projects manager at Southern Company. Uh, I'm also a research engineer in the Research Environmental Technology Group, uh, which is part of Research Environmental Affairs. So uh, I guess assuming that most of you know what Southern Company is, uh, I'll get, just give you maybe a little bit of a background on the company. Uh, Southern Company is a publicly held utilities company, primarily in the southeastern United States. We have operating companies that serve the southeastern states, Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, and, and here in Georgia. Uh, we also have Southern Power, which is our wholesale group. Uh, it's our wholesale power uh, non-regulated group. And so basically, we have just just under 46,000, this is as of 2013, so this might have changed a little bit, basically just under 46,000 uh, gigawatt, 46 gigawatts of uh, generating capacity over uh, 300 generating units, uh, 64 and a half billion in total assets, 17.09 billion in revenues, this was for 2013, and 1.64 billion in net income. Uh, I'm gonna be discussing CCUS in particular, but this environmental, um, part on the top right corner, 8.7 billion in completed environmental projects as of the end of 2013, and then another 3.6 billion planned. Transmission, 27,000 uh, miles of transmission lines over 3,300 substations. Distribution, 159,000 line miles and over 4 million poles. And again, I've already mentioned that we operate primarily across the southeast, but uh, we have Southern Power, which kind of goes throughout the nation. So before I get on this, earlier a gentleman asked Dr. Monroe a question about whether we would actually retire as many coal plants as uh, were projected. And uh, I was kind of sad that he didn't mention CCS in his answer, but uh, he did that for a reason. Basically, uh, CCS is expensive, and, and I'll get into it a little bit later. We include it in our projections uh, because we want to keep coal viable. We want to have a diverse uh, generation portfolio, and that's kind of, you know, what you see here. 2005, coal made up 71% of our generation capacity, and then by 2013, you, you can see that it shrank to about 38%, and uh, guys, don't beat me up. The, the one on the left there doesn't exactly add to 100%, but uh, because of the oil that we had that we've since gotten rid of, um, so you can see gas has increased basically because of the price. And as I just mentioned, uh, we really do want to have a diverse generation portfolio, which consists of nuclear, 21st century coal, natural gas, renewables, and of course, as Larry talked a lot about, energy efficiency. Uh, this helps us to, to really keep our rates low for our customers and in the southeast, we actually have some of the lowest rates in the country. Uh, in order to really maintain our diverse generation portfolio like we want, one of Southern Company's goals is to have a really robust national research and development effort uh, to create technologies that we can implement in the future. And so that technology, uh, the one that I'm particularly interested in is CCS. Uh, basically, there are four steps to CCS, a lot more, but it can kind of be condensed down into four steps. Uh, the first is you have to capture or concentrate CO2. A lot of guys, a lot of companies do that uh, different ways, solvent, sorbent technologies. Uh, the next one, you have to compress it. Uh, typically what you see is that at the site, you'll compress it to about 50, 1,500 PSI. 
um, for transport to the well site. And, and from there, it'll be boosted up another, maybe close to another 1,000 PSI before you inject it. Uh, and of course, transportation is the third step. The fourth step is actual injection and sequestration. So the CCS efforts that we have ongoing at Southern Company, uh, really it's widespread across, across the comp company. You all, most of you know probably about the Kemper project, which I won't discuss specifically, but we also have other uh, initiatives uh, ongoing through scale up of CCS technologies. And, and it really starts in the National Carbon Capture Center that we have uh, at Plant Gaston in Wilsonville, Alabama, uh, just south of Birmingham. Uh, basically there, these technology providers can come in and they can test their technologies. They can uh, develop their own IP um, through these small scale tests. And I say small scale, it's, it's larger than lab scale. Uh, the maximum capacity at the National Carbon Capture Center is one megawatt. So um, whereas in the lab, you may be limited to uh, kilowatt size and, and also you don't have the ability to use real flue gas. Uh, so what we see there is that we're able to use post-combustion and pre-combustion. Uh, so post-combustion is pretty simply uh, uh, carbon capture on the end of a, of a unit, post-combustion as it sounds. Pre-combustion is like an IGCC, um, you're making uh, syn, syn gas and so carbon monoxide and uh, water and you take that through a water gas shift and you make CO2 and hydrogen. Hydrogen is used in a lot of cases to, to produce power and then uh, your CO2 is almost essentially pure, especially compared to post-combustion, um, and, and basically you use the technology to capture it. Uh, from there, I mentioned that basically that's one megawatt capacity at the, ca at the National Carbon Capture Center. From there, we scale up, and when companies are ready to scale up, uh, we host them at several sites across our network. And so, Two that I'll specifically talk about today are uh, our one megawatt demonstration of a solid sorbent at Plant Miller. And this is the first solid sorbent technology at a significant scale. One megawatt doesn't sound very significant, but it's quite a big step over what's been previously accomplished. Uh, this will be research and adsorption process and, and circulating solids. Um, the solid circulation is just uh, as much of it will be just as much of an accomplishment as uh, testing the sorbent itself. The second one, which some of you probably heard about, is the plant berry demonstration project where we're capturing and sequestering about, a, well, we have the capacity for about 150,000 tons a year. Uh, we sequestered maybe 115,000, I believe, to date, and, and captured over 240,000. Uh, this is also first-hand experience at, uh, at this large of a scale when we started back in 2011. Um, as you know now, what I would usually say at this time is that this project is the largest in the world. Uh, it's the largest sequential carbon capture on a coal unit tied to sequestration, but I can't say that since the Sask Power project has started now. Uh, and uh, then also MHI's project in Texas will be even larger, so th that's no longer in here. So back to the National Carbon Capture Center, uh, I mentioned that this is a, a world-class neutral test facility and a highly specialized staff, uh, Southern Company staffs it. And uh, this is all funded uh, by the DOE and then the companies that come in and test their technologies. Uh, what's unique about the National Carbon Capture Center, apart from the fact that you can come in and test on a real uh, boiler, coal boiler with uh, real flue gas, is the fact that you get to retain all of your IP. So anything that you develop there, the company gets to keep. Uh, onto the one megawatt capture demo at Plant Miller. Uh, again, I mentioned that this is a sorbent technology, uh, really the first of its kind at this large of a scale. Uh, ma majority of the funding for this project also comes from DOE. And uh, what we'll be doing is to demonstrate 90% capture, which is roughly 2,100 pounds per hour of CO2 using this solid sorbent material. And basically, it's kind of like a sand, um, the same consistency, almost the same particle size, so same PSD. Uh, and so really, uh, separate from the sorbent testing itself, controlling this sand, controlling the flow of the sand is actually quite difficult. And like I mentioned, will also be part of this testing. So this is 
the ADA SORB process. ADA ES is the owner of this technology. Um, so let's see. Okay, so basically, uh, you've got your flue gas that passes in. First, they condition it. They have to remove SO2 because SO2 is toxic to amine uh, sorbents or solvents. And this sorbent is coated with an amine. It's a uh, was described as an ion exchange resin that's coated in an amine and uh, basically circulates through the CO2 adsorber. And uh, when the CO2 goes to the adsor adsorber, we've also got this falling sorbent that comes down the separate stages in the adsorber and then passes over to the regenerator where you contact it with heat, where you liberate the CO2. Uh, and then from there, the CO2 can be compressed and, and sent to an injection site. So those two together, you can see the flue gas coming in and the sorbent coming down the separate stages, they contact and go over to the regenerator. Uh, like I just said, heat, you liberate the CO2. Uh, CO2 is go, go through, goes through a few cyclones in a back house to remove the dust and then you can compress it. This is the 25 megawatt CCS demo at Plant Berry. Uh, so we receive well, first on the project, um, this project is MHI's technology. It's the KMCDR process. Uh, it stands for Kansai Mitsubishi Carbon Dioxide Recovery. And uh, we partnered with them on the carbon capture portion of this project. Uh, the actual transportation sequestration was performed through a, a DOE C-CARB uh, initiative. So Southeastern Regional Carbon Sequestration Group. Uh, it's one of the partnerships under the Southern States Energy Board. Uh, so we received flue gas from the plant, Plant Berry. This is in Mobile, Alabama. 25 megawatt slipstream equipment, which is roughly um, 500 metric tons per day of CO2. It goes through the flue gas quench column first to lower the temperature because you want to capture at a lower temperature. When you liberate the CO2, you have to increase the temperature. So if you're capturing, if you're trying to capture at a high temperature, it's not going to work. So we reduce the temperature, we scrub uh, with a limestone scrubbing system to remove the SO2, which is poisonous to the amine solvent. And uh, then we pass the solvent through the absorber where it contacts the uh, flue gas and separates the CO2 in stages. From there, it moves over to the solvent regeneration step, what we call the CO2 stripper. And uh, we pass the CO2 the, to the compressor and dehydration unit. We compress it there to about 1500 PSI and uh, send it offsite 12 miles through a pipeline uh, where they uh, compress it additionally to about 2,500 PSI um, and then send it down the well. Um, this is in the Citronelle Dome. Uh, well is operated by Denbury Resources and I believe the depth is somewhere around 9,500 feet. So it's, it's quite a deep injection. Uh, we've got several different monitoring wells drilled around the injection site where they do uh, vertical cross well uh, seismic profiling. Um, at, CO2 surface flux and a range of different tests at the site itself. So this is a process flow basically just describing what I just said about the CO2 capture plant. Uh, we get flue gas in, we have to cool it, we scrub it to remove the SO2. Um, I said several times that SO2 degrades the solvent, but what it actually does is it will cause either heat stable salts to form and so you can increase corrosion in your metal, in your material, uh, or it will cause nitramine and nitrosamine formation, which leave out the stack uh, and subsequently in, in, uh, leading to a loss of KS1 solvent, um, which is rather expensive. From there, of course, it goes to the stripper. We get the CO2 off with heat, steam, and um, send the CO2 to a compressor. Dehydration unit removes the water. We put it in a pipeline at 1,500 PSI, 12 miles to the site injected at about 2,500 PSI. So these are some of the milestones that we have for the project at Plant Berry. Uh, we started gas in at about uh, middle of 2011 and we commissioned the CO2 compressor in August of 2011. So at that time, we were already capturing CO2. The pipeline wasn't commissioned yet. We commissioned the pipeline in March of 2012 and we started jet injection in August of 2012. So you might say, why did you start injection a year after you started capture? Uh, we were ready to uh, really commission the CO2 pipeline and to start CO2 injection back in 2011, but due to some of the permitting issues we encountered with putting CO2 in the ground, 
since it hadn't been done a lot, uh, we kind of ran into some delays and ended up with what was really a modified class five injection uh, well, which uh, they said they, they really wouldn't want to do again in the state of Alabama and was also a first. So total operation time, we've, uh, this is as of uh, September. I think at this point we've, inje we've operated over 13,000 hours, total amount of CO2 captured, um, close to 240,000, total amount of CO2 injected, close to 115,000, and then the, the rate of capture at Plant Berry is about 500 metric tons per day, which uh, is basically equivalent to a 25 megawatt slipstream. The CO2 removal efficiency is 90%. It says greater than 90% because in some of our parametric testing, we did actually run the system a little bit higher. CO2 stream purity, uh, this is basically food grade CO2 that we're producing. So 99.9 .9 plus percent uh, I think it's 99.97% uh, pure CO2 stream that we're producing. Steam consumption, I've got that listed on there um, for a reason. Most of you probably don't see too much significance in that number, but the steam consumption actually directly relates to the energy penalty of the plant, and uh, of course that's energy efficiency. So uh, what you might see is that also called as par uh, uh, parasitic load. So your parasitic load is based on the amount of steam that you're using, uh, how much work do you use to run your compressor, um, and your entire process. So uh, 0.98 corresponds to roughly a 20, 21% parasitic load. So from unit five at Plant Berry, uh, which is a 700 megawatt unit, to power this 25 megawatt unit, uh, if we were gonna scale up full commercial scale to 700 megawatts, it would take about 21% of the 700 megawatts to run the plant. So, so you would be losing all those megawatts that you would normally be able to put back on the grid and sell. Uh, and so that's one of the numbers that we're trying to lower. Um, and 20, 21% is actually quite good. What you, what you see in a lot of other cases is upwards of 30, 40%. I've seen some DOE projections that were actually higher. So this is just a, uh, to show kind of what we've been doing at the plant. Yeah, we've got the plant. Yeah, you're capturing CO2, but what are you really doing there? So one of the first things that we did was just to evaluate the baseline uh, mass and heat balance. And uh, what, we, what we really saw that we didn't expect to see was that we were operating with less steam than we thought we'd need, which, as I just said, uh, it directly relates to the energy penalty of the plant. Emissions and waste streams monitoring. Uh, I think I've got another slide, the next slide, to, to kind of describe what we're doing as far as limiting uh, the effect of SO3 on the solvent. And uh, of course, we're still working on that. Parametric testing, uh, I mentioned parametric testing. When we came up, we, we verified several different operating conditions, uh, operated a higher CO2 capture just to see if we could, um, and, and also to find the baseline of the plant, which is really the point of parametric testing. Performance optimization, I just showed you a 0.98 tons of steam per ton of CO2, which corresponds to about a 20, 21% energy penalty. But we actually operated uh, at steady state for quite a while at, at 0.95 uh, tons of steam per ton of CO2, which is, which is actually less than 20% uh, parasitic load. The dy dynamic response test uh, for load following, uh, basically that just says that uh, MHI developed a automatic load adjustment control system and an opt optimized operation control system, which would uh, control this plant under uh, varying uh, scenarios like load fluctuations from the boiler or uh, different types of CO2 demand uh, at the end of the pipeline. So if you're supplying the CO2 to someone who's using it to produce methanol or something, for example, if their demand changes, uh, this control system is capable of changing operations to match their demand uh, with a very small lag. Uh, Long-term test to validate equipment reliability and life. Uh, I mentioned actually we're actually over 100,000 metric tons of CO2 injected, but that was the initial goal, which we hit in October of 2013. Uh, and high impurities loading test. Uh, this isn't specific to the MHI process that we use, but we did verify that ambient emissions increase 
with higher SO3 loading, which is typical for any type of amine process. And this is the graphic that I had on uh, solvent emissions reductions with increased uh, SO3. Um, basically, like I just said, all amine systems are affected by SO3 in this way. Uh, it increases their emission. It's thought because the uh, SO3 will form sort of an aerosol uh, with the water in this aqueous system and cause a lot of your solvent to be carried out. And in the case for KS1, it's rather expensive, so you want to try to limit that as much as possible. Uh, and, and they were able to do that with what was basically amounted to a 90% reduction uh, with uh, internal packing design in the, in the, CO2, in the uh, absorber column. So test plans now at the plant. Uh, we recently finished building and uh, installing this new built-in reboiler that I mentioned. Uh, basically, we've got this huge shell and tube reboiler, a uh, massive amount of structural steel required, um, tremendous amount of piping that we could eliminate with a smaller kind of a vertical designed uh, uh, reboiler with uh, a specialized packing inside the reboiler. High efficiency system. I've got a slide on that in a minute. Basically, uh, we're recovering waste heat from the regenerator and also from the flue gas and using that back in the uh, boiler feed water uh, back in the plant. And uh, replace dehydration glycol. Part of compressing CO2 is removing the water. One of the problems that we saw early on in the operation of this plant was that we had actual glycol consumption as well. And so we've tried different additives. Uh, we recently replaced it and we're evaluating operations uh, since. So this, is, this is the HES. This stands for High Efficiency System. And uh, like I just said, we're recovering waste heat from the top of the CO2 regenerator. So the CO2 gas comes out of the regenerator column hot. We pass that through a heat exchanger. And then we use that heat uh, to preheat the water that goes into the uh, boiler feed. And uh, we also do the same with flue gas uh, from the plant. So some of the benefits that we are expecting to see are an improvement in the removal of hazardous toxins across the ESP, like uh, mercury and selenium and SO3, air quality control systems, cost reduction, uh, potential to simplify the boiler and steam turbine cycles and reduction of total energy penalty of the uh, carbon capture plant. I mentioned that we're somewhere around 20, 21% parasitic load right now, but we're expecting to maybe get down a couple percentage points which doesn't seem like a big deal, but that saves you about 70 megawatts on a, on a full scale unit. So on a 700 megawatt unit, that's 70 megawatts you can put back on the uh, grid. Schedule, we actually just recently finished construction in uh, this month, we're com commissioning and we'll be operating all of next year. So having said all that, What's really the point for us to do that? It's a path to commercialization. So uh, we're able to take these small kilowatt-sized lab-scale technologies, take them to the National Carbon Capture Center, let them uh, develop their technology a little bit more there. When they're ready, they'll come to us at our host sites, and they can test at a megawatt, 25 megawatts, 50 megawatts if they want, um, in the path towards commercialization. So. I talked a lot about MHI's technology, and it's the technology that we're using at Plant Berry. Uh, recently, I believe in June, MHI announced that uh, they would be the technology supplier for the CO2 capture plant at NRG's Washington Parish uh, facility in Thompson's, Texas. This is going to take 240 megawatt equivalent of CO2 from a 650 megawatt coal-fired boiler. 240 megawatt equivalents about 40. 700, 4,800 uh, tons of CO2 per day that they're going to capture there. And it's a 90% recovery rate. Um, the CO2 is going to be used for enhanced oil recovery at the West Ranch oil field in, in Jackson County, Texas. It's a 12 inch diameter pipeline. And from the site to the uh, EOR site, it's about 81 miles. Uh, and they're slated for operation in Q4 of 2016. That's it. Questions? Thank you. Uh, I see a couple of questions, actually. We have a mic. I'm not sure. 
The microphone's coming. Uh, John Boyle with FuelTech. Um, all of your numbers show 90% CO2 capture, and I'm wondering if that's the most efficient dollar per ton of CO2, or if you could get more efficient at 50%, or could you push it to 95%, or have you really it, optimized that already? Yeah, so we also do partial, we also look at partial CO2 capture um, as part of our internal projections at Southern Company. Uh, but really, we use 90% CO2 capture in the industry as it's essentially a standard for almost full CO2 capture because uh, essentially every eight years, uh, the EPA can come out and revise their ruling. So the one that they published to the Federal Register this year says that you have to limit the emissions from a coal plant um, down to, I think, 1,000 uh, pounds of CO2 per megawatt. And they can take that down even further eight years from now and we fully expect them to. So kind of what we're looking at now is what does it cost to do complete CO2 capture and then partial capture. So we're evaluating both. I saw a question. Well, okay. That's fine, you're close. <laughs> uh, my name is Joe Settles with East Kentucky Power. When you go through the dehydration process for the CO2, how much water is produced and do you have to treat that water? I unfortunately can't tell you how much water we're making because it's a proprietary process and that's a specific piece of data. Um, so, sorry. Okay, I hope you can answer my question. I hope I can too. <laughs> I hate doing that. <laughs> I'm Bob Gillio and Foster Wheeler. My question is simple. So you mentioned uh, plant barrier, you demonstrated 21% ox, ox power load parasitic load right does that now that is just for the co2 capture process that, that you've demonstrated there so if i was to apply to a power plant i'd have to add in the additional five to ten percent typical ox load on a power plant is that the way to think about it so a total could be thirty percent like the original uh epri and epa estimates were saying that's right yeah okay Uh, Howard Fitzgerald, I'm with LaWass, North America. Uh, you said that you want to deliver SO2 uh, free gas to the process there at Barry because it's a poison. Uh, free being how many ppm of SO2 do you, do you look for that gas to be delivered at? So I can't tell you specifically. So again, that's a key piece of data for not just MHI's technology, but also, for example, ADA uh, at, at Plant Miller. Um, of course, it varies per type of amine that you're using and your goals and how much you want to make up. Uh, but basically, we'd like to see the SO2 uh, go down in the maybe 1 to 3 ppm range. Any additional questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.